Heroes of the Bible, Jonah. This is Jonah. Uh -huh. Jonah was a prophet. That means it was his job to tell people what God told him to say. Yep. One day, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh because the people of Nineveh were doing bad things. Uh... But instead, Jonah ran away. Where are you, please? And went to the port to board a ship going the other way. He was hoping to get away from God. Oh, he sailed for a place called Tarshish. While he was at sea, God sent a great and powerful wind over the sea that caused a storm that seemed like it would break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the sailors tried everything they could think of to save the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah was sound asleep. So the captain went down and said, how can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will help us. Then the crew figured out that Jonah was the reason for the storm. And they asked him, who are you? Why is this happening to us? Jonah told them who he was and that he worshiped the one true God who made the sea. Then he told the sailors to throw him in the sea so the storm would stop. No, why? The sailors still tried to escape the storm, but it was no use. Uh... So they asked God for forgiveness and threw Jonah into the sea. The storm stopped at once. Whoa! The sailors <laughs> were amazed at God's power and they vowed to serve him. Now God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Uh, great. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and nights. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish, and God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Uh, yeah. God told Jonah again to go to the city of Nineveh to tell them what God had said about them. I get it, I get it. This time, Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh to deliver God's message. <coughs> the people of Nineveh stopped doing bad things and turned to God. They were saved because they listened to the message that God had given Jonah. If any of you ever went to Sunday school when you were little, I am almost certain that you heard the story of Jonah. Because the story of Jonah has all the elements in it that kids love, and we love to, um, like drama and mystery and suspense and a kind of a, a villain and a kind of a hero. And so, um, Joan has found its way into many Sunday school classes, into Veggie Tales, and even there's a production at Sight and Sound. But Joan is just not for kids. Joan has a lot of lessons in it that are applicable to us as adults also. So Joan had made a bad decision. And Pastor Donnie told us a little bit of that last week. Pastor Donnie actually left Jonah inside the belly of a whale. And can we just for can we just agree to call it a whale? I don't know that it was a whale. It, just saying a whale is so much easier than saying a very large fish all the time. So if we can just agree, I don't know, it could have been the Loch Ness monster. I don't know. But can we just agree to call it a whale? Everybody okay with that? All right. I know that's not what scripture says. So, but, but we're going to agree that it, it was a whale. So, Pastor Donnie, that was really not a nice place to leave anybody for a week, but that's where chapter one ended, so he had no other choice. Jonah had made a bad choice. He was a prophet of God. God had told him what God wanted him to do. There was no indication that um, Jonah was a little mixed up about that. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think that God has told me something, I will ponder that. Was that God? Was that me? Was that something I ate? Was that the enemy? And I will have this question back and forth in my mind. This does not appear to be true of Jonah. Jonah 
knew clearly what God had told him. He was a prophet. He was used to hearing the voice of the Lord. He knew this. He just didn't like it because he didn't like the Ninevites. And that's understandable to us if we understand who the Ninevites were. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Pastor Donnie told you that last week. But years before this happened, God had given a message to Jonah to speak to King Jeroboam Jeroboam II. And that message was that Assyria would come in and lay siege to Samaria, overtake Samaria, and take captive the Israelites. So Jonah knew what kind of people they were. They were known to be barbaric people. It would be kind of like for us, if God told us, one of us in here, can you imagine if God spoke to you and said, go to the Taliban or go to ISIS and tell them to repent? Who wants to sign up for that? Not me. So Jonah did not like the message that God had given. He did not like the Israelites. So he decided that he would not only not do what God told him to do, but he would do the exact opposite of what God told him to do. Now, can we all agree also that that's not a very wise decision? No. When we pursue our own desires, when we pursue our own agenda, it will lead us to rock bottom. And Jonah was about to find out that that was true. So long story short, and because the video told you and and Pastor Donnie um, told you last week, what has happened so far in the story is that God spoke to Jonah. Jonah disobeyed God. He bought a ticket to Tarshish, got on a ship. There was a storm. They threw him overboard. The storm ceased, and Jonah got gobbled up by a whale. It didn't have to be that way. The story didn't have to go that way. God sent the storm as a wake-up call to Jonah of, hey, Jonah, you're going in the wrong direction. Have you ever experienced that in your life? When you're doing something and and you kind of hit a brick wall, you kind of hit obstacles, and it, it gets hard to do it. Maybe sometimes that's God saying, hey, child, you're going in the wrong direction. It could be a wake-up call for us. Jonah had some options when this storm came. Yes, he confessed to the, uh, the, other, the sailors on board, or whoever they were, that he was a child of God and, and he disobeyed God. But you know what? He never confessed it to God. He never said, God, I have been disobedient. Would you forgive me? I think there's just something in me that thinks that if Jonah had done that at that time, the storm would have ceased. Or Jonah could have said, hey, guys, pull into the next port. I need to buy a ticket for Nineveh. There's something in me that says that if Jonah had done that, the storm would have ceased. But Jonah did neither of those things. And have you ever noticed that when we make one bad decision, we often make another bad decision that follows that bad decision? Like if we tell a lie and then it starts to get discovered, so we tell another lie to cover that lie and then another lie to tell that lie. We see that on television a lot these days, don't we? Especially the news channels. I didn't say that. (laughs) But soon everything will unravel and everything will implode. Or we make a poor financial decision Like we max out our credit cards. So what do we do? Instead of paying it off, we get another credit card. We make one bad decision after another bad decision. Or we don't do something we should do, or we do do something we shouldn't do. And instead of just confessing it and being done with it, we continue to make bad decisions. And this is what Jonah had done. It didn't have to be this way. But if it wasn't, then we would have never had the gospel glorious 
chapter 2 of Jonah. So three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. That seems absurd, preposterous, far-fetched, impossible. Sounds like a myth. Did you know that there are some modern-day Jonas? Did you know that there have other, been other people who have been swallowed by a whale and spit out again? In the early 1800s, there was a man named James Bartley, I believe. He was on a fishing expedition, fell overboard. His buddies tried to find him, couldn't find him. Three days later, they killed a whale, cut it open, and lo and behold, there's James. A little worse for, for wear. His skin was bleached, his hair was bleached, his eyes were glazed over, he was a little crazed in the head, but he was alive. I think we would be too if we were in the belly of a whale for three days. Now, full disclosure, that story has been contested and there's not really any clear decision whether it actually happened or not, but there have been three other people. Later on in the 1800s, there were two gentlemen who, was, who were gobbled up by a whale and spit out and then just as recently as 2021, just two years ago, maybe you saw it on the news, a man named Michael Packard was fishing, fell overboard, gobbled up by a whale, was inside the whale for maybe a minute before the whale decided it didn't like the way he tasted and spit him out. Now, none of those people have been inside the whale for three days and three nights the way Jonah was. And that actually, if we think about it, that seems mm, a little miraculous, doesn't it? To be inside the belly of a whale for three days and three nights and be alive. But I know someone, and so do you, who majors in the miraculous. And this story happens to be in his book, along with many other stories that are miraculous. So we can take it as truth, and also because Jesus uh, validated it, we take it as truth. Jonah was a prophet. The book of Jonah is found among the prophetic books in the Old Testament, even though he was one of the he was the first prophet that God called. Not, he wasn't the first prophet because Moses was a prophet, but he was the first prophet that God called to speak during the times of the kings, during the days of the kings. And even though he was the first prophet God called during that time, the book of Jonah is found further back in the prophetic books. So the prophetic books are not arranged chronologically according to history or according to time. But Jonah's different from the other prophetic books in a couple other ways. All the other prophets, all the other prophetic books are words of the prophet to the people. They are words of um, judgment and calling to repentance and a dooming um, judgment that's going to come and also hope that it's possible. But Jonah is the only well, Hosea a little bit, but Jonah is really the only book that is a story of what the other prophets talked about. It's a story. And in the, in the West, which is where we live, we like things told to us succinctly, concretely, specifically detail. That's what we like. That's how we convey information. In the East, which is where Israel is and where Jonah was, Messages and, story, uh, messages and information are conveyed through stories. Like, that's why Jesus told a lot of parables. He didn't come out all the time and just speak the flat truth. He told a parable that will relay the story. Well, that's what Jonah is. Jonah is not a parable. I'm not saying it's a parable. It's a true story, but it's a story about sinful man and a loving God chasing sinful man down calling sinful man back to him. It's a story about forgiveness, and it's a story about deliverance. And chapter 2 of Jonah is a story within a story. It's the same story within the story. 
For those of you that play Trivial Pursuit, here's, a, here's an answer for you. That's called, in literary terms, that's called an embedded narrative. Okay, so what I mean by that is the entire book of Jonah is about God loving a people so much that he arranges a way for them to know truth and to call them back to him, the Ninevites. But we find in chapter 2, the individual in the story is a sinful person who God loves so much that he's going to chase him down and bring him back to him. So chapter 2 is really the same thing that the entire book is about. You all have this very glazed look on your face, so let me move on. <laughs> I'm a nerd sometimes, I know that. So, you know, the thing that, one of the things that amazes me about this book is not that a man got swallowed by a fish. That's okay. I can, I can, but why did God choose no Jonah in the first place? That's what amazes me. God, I mean, Jonah didn't sign up to be a prophet. God called him to be a prophet. And I always think of a prophet as being someone who's holy and righteous and seeks God and submissive and obedient. And Jonah was none of those things. My mother would have called him a rascal or a scoundrel. So I think, God, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Could you not have found someone else to take your message? Did you not know this about Jonah? Did this escape you? No. God knew all about it. That's what amazes me. God knew what Jonah would do. And yet God chose him anyway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and seen Jonah? I do. Almost every day. Because I know that there are things that God has told me to do. Like forgive those who offend me. Like do good to those who hurt me, like die to self, that's a big one, like take the message of Jesus to those you know, like spend time with him, and every day I fail miserably. So when I look in the mirror, I see Jonah. And aren't we glad that we serve a God that despite our weaknesses and our failures, our mistakes, he still loves us. He still pursues us. He still wants us. He still uses us. Isn't that amazing? So let's go find how Jonah is doing in the belly of that fish. Jonah chapter 2. I, Jonah's a little book. If you have your Bible, it's towards the end of the Old Testament. You might need to use your um, table of contents to find it because it is a little book. You can pass over it real quickly. Or you could read the words. That would be a good idea. I'm reading from the Message Bible today. Then Jonah prayed to his God from the belly of the fish. And he prayed, in trouble, deep trouble, I prayed to God. He answered me. From the belly of the grave, I cried, help. And you heard my cry. You threw me into ocean steps, into a watery grave with ocean waves, ocean breakers crashing over me. I said, I've been thrown away, thrown out, out of your sight, and I'll never again lay eyes on your holy temple. The ocean gripped me by the throat. The ancient abyss grabbed me and held me tight. My head was all tangled in seaweed, and at the bottom of the sea where the mountains take root, I was as far down 
as a body can go. And the gates were slamming shut behind me forever. I love the way the Message Bible puts that first line. In trouble. Deep trouble. I mean, we all know there's trouble. But then there's deep trouble. There's nothing like a splash of cold water in the face to wake you up. And Jonah was having a wake-up call from God. As he fell into that raging sea, he gives us somewhat of a description of what is happening to him, and he is going down. I want you to try to imagine with me what that must have been like. He's going down deeper and deeper. I don't know if Jonah was a swimmer. He might not have been a swimmer. I'm sure he didn't have a life preserver on him. But he's going deeper and deeper in that water where it's getting darker and darker, and it's getting colder and colder, and, and the seaweed is, is just strangling him, and he feels his body being pulled down. People who have um, come back from uh, near-drowning experiences say that the, the pressure is so great, it feels like your head is going to explode. And your chest has that pressure, and you, and you try to gasp for air. And of course, when you gasp for air, your lungs fill, and then you go unconscious. And that's where Jonah was at that time. Because when we pursue our own agendas, and we pursue our own ways, there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end of which is death. When we pursue our own ways, it takes us to rock bottom. And that is exactly where Jonah was headed, both literally and figuratively, both physically and spiritually. Jonah is headed towards rock bottom. And he cries out. Help. Although I don't think he literally spoke the words, because once you speak the words, <laughs> you lose your air and the water comes in. I think in his heart he cried out. And besides that, if he had cried out literally, was there anyone there to hear him? Yes, there was. His God heard him. And whether he cried out Actually, or it was in his heart, his God could hear his heart. He could hear that cry for help of, I am desperate here. Help to the only one who could help him. And God heard that cry. And God sent a savior in the form of a very big fish. God sent a savior in the form of a very big fish to not only keep him from drowning, but to protect him from his own self-destructive tendencies. You see, the amazing thing was, as Jonah was resisting God, God was persisting with Jonah. And as Jonah was running away from God, God was running towards Jonah. And he does the same for us. No matter where we are in our walk, whether we are close to him or we are running away from him, God persists with us and he runs towards us. I wonder what it was like in the belly of that whale. I don't know whether Jonah had passed out, had gone unconscious before the whale swallowed him up, and he woke up in the whale and goes, ooh, where am I? Or I don't know whether he saw the whale, as was in the video here, come. That would be a pretty fearful thing, don't you think? Seeing, I, I think that would be a pretty fearful thing. So however he got in there, I don't know, but he was in there 
what do you think it was like in the belly of that fish at rock bottom? Dark, messy, cold, things floating by you. And the smell must have been horrific. You know what? There is no smell like seafood. (laughs) And there is no smell like rotted seafood. Walt and I went for a walk on Thursday, Friday, don't remember when. No, it was Monday because it was trash day. It was Monday. (laughs) And our neighbors must have had crabs a couple days before. There is... No smell like that. And you know what? I'm going to stop here, too, because I think some of you are getting green out there. So, okay, (laughs) just know, just know that in the belly of that whale, it was not like being at the Ritz-Carlton, okay? It was not a pleasant experience. I don't believe that anybody in here has ever literally been in the belly of a whale. If you have, I'd like to talk to you after service. (laughs) And the probability that anybody in here will ever be in the belly of a whale is very, very small. Literally. But have you ever been in a place where you look back and you see something in your life that you've done or you've said that you've regretted and you just wish you could have a do-over. You just wish you could rewind the tape, go back in time and do it over. And guilt and shame because of it are your constant companions. I think Jonah might have been feeling some of that. Have you ever been in a place, in a situation in your life that it's dark and hard and messy and desperate? Have you ever been in a place where fear grips you so much? In a place that you think that situation, whatever it might be, could literally crush you and maybe even kill you? Have you ever been in a place where you are confused and frustrated and you don't know what's going on and you don't know what to do and you think there is no way out where there is no light and no hope that you can see? Have you ever been in a place or a situation where you feel alone, that nobody understands and nobody is there for you? Have you ever been in a place where the future looms ahead of you, heavy and dark and unpredictable? If you've never been in a place like that, I say this with all sincerity, good for you. Good for you. Thank God for that. Praise God for that. It's a little hard to get through life on planet Earth being unscathed by some of the things that are dealt to us. And I don't think, but I know that there are some people in here that have been in a place like that at some point in your life. And I know that there are some people in here who are in that place right now. Please hear what I'm going to say. Especially for those of you that are there right now. 
God will not leave you there alone. He will not. He did not with Jonah. He will not for, with us. He will hunker down with us right next to us, just waiting for us to realize that he's been there all the time. And he might be all we have and all we need. But he is all we need. Some of you might be in that place because of decisions that you have made. Things that you have done. Some of you might be in that place because of the decisions of others around you. Because unfortunately, when we are in relationship with other people, the consequences of their bad decisions spills over on us. And sometimes we pay that price. But whether you are there because of your own bad decisions or because of the decisions of others, God will not leave you. He will not abandon you. And he is all you need. Can we go to verse the next scripture, please? Yet, I love that little word, yet. Little three-letter word. Word that we just kind of skip over like it's just a filler. But it's so pregnant with meaning. Yet, despite Jonah's mistakes, his bad decisions, his rebellion, his arrogancy, his independence, his running from God, despite that, despite where he was at the moment, despite what the future looked like, because I'm sure to Jonah, he thought this was the end. Why would you think anything differently? He thought he was a goner. He thought game over, done deal. But yet... Yet, despite all of that, you pulled me from that grave alive. Oh, God, my God. When my life was slipping away, I remembered God. And my prayer got through to you, made it all the way to your holy temple. Those who worship hollow gods, God frauds, walk away from their only true love. In the darkness of that place, Jonah's eyes were being opened. In the darkness of that place, Jonah was seen more clearly than he ever had before. And in the darkness of that place, Jonah's focus was beginning to change. It was beginning to change. And he realized the goodness of God. He realized his own waywardness. He realized the goodness of God. And in that line that says, um, those who worship hollow gods, a lot of commentaries, a lot of, I guess, commentators write commentaries. So a lot of commentators think that Jonah is referring to the people on the ship that threw him overboard, that they served pagan gods. And those people are a whole lot smarter than I am. I know that. But I have a different perspective on that. I think Jonah at this point is realizing the gods that he followed himself were hollow. That the gods that he followed himself, being his God, his own desires, his own wants, were keeping him from the love of God. They were the barrier there. And Jonah's beginning to realize that those idols needed to come down. God's highest priority for our lives is not that we be comfortable and prosperous and even happy or have titles behind our name or a large bank account. 
Those are the world's priorities. God's priorities for our life is that we know him, that we come to him, that we have relationship with him. And he will use any vehicle it takes in our lives to accomplish that end. In Jonah's life, he's using the smelly belly of a whale. In our lives, it might look something a little different. And it's usually not the picture-perfect vehicles that accomplish the most. It's usually those vehicles that are messy and hard and difficult that will draw us to him, that will cause us to recognize the idols that we have clung to, the idols that have kept us from being in relationship with him. And it will cause us to open our eyes to the greatness of God. This is what was happening to Jonah at that time. Vehicles that God might use in our lives might be a unexpected, unwanted medical diagnosis. It might be a financial disaster. It might be a marriage that's in shambles. It might be a child who has strayed and has broken our heart. It might be the loss of a loved one. It might be betrayal by someone we thought we could trust. All those things that we thought would kill us. We thought they were so unfair and they were so hard. But God is using them. God will use them because he uses everything. God will use them to bring life to us, true life, his life. Because in relationship with him, there is real life. I am sure that Jonah thought that that whale was his coffin and tomb and grave. I am sure he thought that that whale was going to bring him death. And yet God, but God, here's another but God, God used it to bring him life. I'm sure under normal circumstances, someone being beaten and hung on a cross would bring death. But God used it to bring life. And I'm sure entombing a body in a sealed cave for three days would ensure death. But God used it to bring life, not only to the person inside, but to all mankind. So those things, what I am saying, those things, those vehicles that God uses in our lives to bring us life are sometimes messy and hard, and they look like they're going to kill us. But if we would just open our eyes to see God working and allow but God to work in that circumstance, we just might find that it's those very things that bring us true life and real life and everlasting life and sweet life in Jesus. A.W. Tozer, who is a um, theologian, said, in every generation, the people who have found God have been those who have come to the end of themselves. Recognizing their hopelessness, they have been ready to throw themselves on the mercy and the grace of a forgiving God. Mercy and grace are such beautiful words, but sometimes, you know, they're messy. Sometimes they're messy in our lives. Something else is happening with Jonah. In the beginning of his discourse, it talks about going down, going down, going down, going down to rock bottom. We come to the point where Jonah is not only not looking down and he's not looking horizontally, but he begins looking up because he's beginning to see clearly. Could we have the, the next passage, please. 
And Jonah says, but I am worshiping you, God. I am calling out in thanksgiving, and I'll do what I promised I'd do. Salvation belongs to God. Jonah has gone from a heart of rebellion to a heart of thanksgiving. All because he's in the belly of a smelly fish. Remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Donnie talked about um, a healthy dose of thanksgiving in our prayers. Jonah's beginning to give thanks. But I want you to think about something. His circumstance has not changed at this point. He's still in that smelly belly. What's changed is his focus. And his focus has caused his heart to change. And his heart causes him to to begin to praise God and thank God right in that smelly belly. He has no idea he's going to get out. We know he got out, but he had no idea at that point. We know the end of the story. He didn't. It was in the middle of it that he gave thanks. So often when we are going through something, we get out on the other side and we look back and we go, oh, that's what God was doing. Thank you, Lord. But right here in the middle, believing that death is his doorstep. He gives thanks. He gives praise. His his focus had changed. His heart had changed. And because his heart changed, his situation changed. God heard his prayer of thanksgiving. God heard his praise. And so God commands the whale, the really big fish, to spit him out. And I'm sure he's spitting him out on dry land and not the ocean where he'd have to swim again. And I think, and I can't prove this, but I think that God had that whale do a U-turn, and he swam as close to Nineveh as he could get and spit him out right there. All because of a heart change. That which would bring death brought life all because of a God who is relentless in his love for us. I don't know if this is true. And I'd really honestly ask you to ponder this and and at some point share your thoughts with me. But as far as I can tell, I believe that Jonah chapter 2 is the only chapter in the Bible that has the complete gospel story in a nutshell. You go from a place of sinful man to a place of repentance, to a place of crying out to God, to a place of deliverance and freedom. It is the gospel message in a nutshell. And I think it's the only chapter in the Bible that does that. Isn't that amazing? So in closing, Jonah went on a journey. He went on a physical journey, but more importantly, he went on a spiritual journey. He went on the journey from rebellion to praising God obeying God, and to deliverance. And you know what? His journey is really not so different than ours. He had a smelly belly of a whale in his journey, but we've all got something in our journeys that draws closer to Christ. He hit rock bottom in his journey, but we all, at some point, might hit rock bottom, and that's the time we look up, and that's the time we find God. And that's the time that we find our God is faithful. So what do we do? What do we learn from Jonah? If we ever hit rock bottom or are in a figurative smelly belly of a whale. The first thing is we cry out to a loving God. Despite how we got there, 
Despite ourselves, we cry out to a loving God. The second thing we do is to acknowledge our own sin and acknowledge our need for God. The third thing we do is we take the focus off of ourselves. We take the focus off of the situation and we put our focus on God and trust in him. And then the last thing we do is give thanks. Give thanks and praise and surrender to God. Jonah, the, the last part of Jonah's um, prayer, or yes, it was a prayer. The scripture says it was a prayer. Jonah says, I'll do what I promised I'd do. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, you see, Jonah was, was an Israelite. So he was a chosen person. He, he, was, he was already chosen by God. He already had a relationship with God. He was a prophet. He had a relationship with God. But Jonah had strayed. Jonah had strayed. And so here, as his eyes are opened, he recommits himself to God. This is really a passage about recommitment. There may be somebody in here who, who doesn't know this God we're talking about. And if that's you, I want you to know that although you may not know this God, he knows you. He has always known you. He created you. He loves you. He pursues you. And he will not stop pursuing you because he wants you to be in relationship with him. He wants to shower you with his favor and his love. But I think for most of us in here, most of us have accepted him at one point or another. But there's the possibility that as we've known him, we've also strayed from him. We've maybe become lukewarm, as Revelation puts it. We maybe have lost our, our passion for him. It's become mediocre. We've become complacent in our walk with him. That's what Jonah's about. Coming back fully to him. Recommitting our lives to him. I heard something on the radio this week, last week. I think it was last week. It doesn't matter. Um, I think most of you in here know who James Baker was. He was a tele-evangelist, tele big time, big name, um, back in the 90s. 80, 70, I don't know, a long time ago. But he did some very unethical things. And so he ended up in prison. And there was someone who interviewed him in prison. And he said, when did you stop loving God? And James Baker said, oh, I never stopped loving God. I stopped fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We may love God, but do we fear him? And do we see him as holy and righteous? Do we have a reverence, a holy reverence for him? Do we have a passion for him? Do we stand in awe of who he is? So if you don't, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, or you have and you'd like to recommit to him today, because Jonah said, I'll do what I promised to do. I'm going to ask you to stand as we close in prayer this morning. Father God, thank you that you are a loving God who pursues us passionately, relentlessly. 
Thank you that it's not your desire that any should perish, but that all would come to everlasting life through Jesus. Thank you that you've made the way for us to be in relationship with you. Thank you that daily you call us unto yourself. Father, thank you that you will use absolutely anything in our lives to reveal yourself to us and to call us to you or call us back to you because your heart beats for us, Lord. And we are so thankful and we are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.